The Manasla avalanche in 2012 was one of the events that resulted in the deaths of 11. People, like the rest of the mountains, aspire to stand on their peaks in awe of the world below. However, the mountains do not always yield easily to the climbers. In this video, we'll take a look at everything you need to know about the 2012 Manasla disaster. A rocky peak climbs high in Nepal's northern Himalayas. Mount Manasla, which towers over the surrounding mountains, is the world's eighth highest peak, rising to an astonishing elevation of 8,156 meters. The mountain appears to be both beautiful and dangerous from a distance due to its extraordinarily steep slopes and broad ridges covered in jagged cornices. This frightening mountain has claimed the lives of over 80 individuals, living up to its reputation. Let's discuss the events of September 23rd and how commercial expeditions overconfidence led to the terrible death of 11 persons in an avalanche. When British mountaineers first became aware of Manasla in 1950, it piqued the interest of Westerners in Nepal. After the mountain was discovered by outsiders, exploration teams began formulating a way to climb it. A prospective ascension route from the mountain's northeastern face was reported by many teams. Despite making arrangements to ascend Mount Manasla, the British team never attempted to do so. Despite the fact that the British did not attempt to climb the mountain at the time, multiple Japanese teams attempted to do so. Eventually, Mount Manasu was conquered by Toshio Imanishi of Japan and Galtsin Norbu of Nepal in 1956. Despite the popularity of the mountain at the time, the next successful climb of Manaslu occurred in 1971. One reason it took so long was because the mountaineers were not well liked by the people at the time. During the trips from 1950 to 1956, they became increasingly hostile to climbers, particularly after a devastating avalanche in 1954 damaged a monastery and killed 18 people. As a result, inhabitants in the vicinity began to believe that the climbers had insulted the gods. Despite this, by the 1970s, the locals began permitting climbers to return to the summit without more hostility. Mount Manaslu's climbing experience pulls mountaineers to its sharp, steep slopes in the hopes of reaching its perilous pointed pinnacle, despite the fact that it is not the most popular of the 8,000-meter peaks. Despite the frightening appearance, the most popular route for climbers to reach Manaslu's summit is very simple and offers a distinct climbing experience when compared to the other 8,000-meter Himalayan peaks. Many climbers utilize Manaslu as a warm-up mountain before attempting Everest. Because it is a shorter 8,000-meter climb, many people use it as a training ground before attempting the world's highest peak. Climbers on Everest are familiar with calamity as well. Learn about more than 200 bodies that remain on Mount Everest. Because Manaslu normally receives significant snowfall during the Himalayan monsoon season, most summit efforts take place in the early fall. After it is at time to settle and harden, the more snow that accumulates on the mountain aids climbers' ascent. Because the mountain's steep, rocky ridge hasn't yet been entirely covered in snow and ice, navigating it in the spring is much more difficult. When the mountain is battered by high winds, it forms the unique cornices that line the peak's summit. Because of the size of these cornices, it is thought that most climbers mistake a false top for the summit and never reach Manaslu's true summit. Many people believe that ascending above Manaslu's fourth summit is borderline suicidal since the genuine top stands on a steep, rocky outcropping that looks to be a gigantic, unsupported cornice when entirely covered in deep snow in the autumn. Apart from the last push to the top, Manaslu is regarded as one of the easier 8,000-meter mountains to climb because of its relatively flat gradient and lack of demanding technical expertise. The peak is a terrible experience because it straddles a steep drop-off of hundreds of meters. Despite this reputation, Manaslu has had a high number of fatalities when compared to other 8,000-meter peaks such as Cho Oyu. The glacier's ascent is hazardous with vast gaping crevasse fields, an especially active icefall between camps 1 and 2, and large menacing Sirac encircling its upper ridges. Furthermore, the risk of avalanches on the summit has generated concerns about the peak's safety. Along with these dangers, climbers attempting to reach the summit of Manaslu must be cautious of snow conditions in order to avoid being washed away by a natural disaster. This is due to the fact that the mountain receives a lot of snow each year and has warmer temperatures than other 8,000-meter peaks. In September 2012, the climbing season on Manaslu was in full swing. Snow fell over several days in 2012, making for an unfavorable start to the climbing season. Although the weather was not ideal initially, 
a 10-day window developed around September 15th, prompting the mountaineers to scale the mountain in preparation for their summit attempt. The difference this year was that Camp 3 was located lower than usual during the climbing season since a large Ciroc field would give wind protection at the lower Camp 3. While the standard Camp 3 location was about 100 meters higher up the mountain, it was also substantially more exposed to the fierce winds that were constantly pelting the mountain. A heavy snowfall enveloped Manaslu on September 22, 2012, preventing climbers attempting to reach the summit. They spent the night in their tents, attempting to weather the storm and get some rest before daylight. On September 23rd, about 4.30 a.m., while most climbers were asleep on the mountain, a gigantic serac believed to be 600 meters wide broke off above Camp 3, triggering a horrific avalanche that rapidly acquired pace as it slid down the mountain. The avalanche dragged away 31 people from Camp 3 as it ripped down the mountain and through the camp, uprooting the tents as it went. Glenn Plake, a professional skier attempting to reach the summit of the mountain without using oxygen and then skiing back down, recalled reading in his tent as Gregory Costa slept in his sleeping bag next to him. Costa was thrown out of the tent and was never seen again. After the initial avalanche caused gust of wind blew the tents and climbers at Camp 2, they thought the worst was over. They switched their attention up the mountain to assess the magnitude of the calamity. Greg Hill, a professional skier from Canada, recalls seeing headlamps strewn across the mountain above him and initially assuming that the climbers were conducting some early morning acclimatization. He soon discovered that Camp 3 was no longer visible and realized that the avalanche had swept away the camp and its residents. Hill and the other climbers at Camp 2 made the decision to hurry up the mountain to help with rescue attempts. By morning, helicopters had been dispatched and a thorough search for the 31 climbers killed in the avalanche had begun. By the end of September 23, 2012, eight persons had been identified as dead, while three remained unaccounted for. Unfortunately, the fates of the three missing people had all but been decided as the days passed in the aftermath of the disaster. Many of the surviving climbers abandoned their attempt to reach the top, but a few remained and attempted to reach Manaslu's summit. Remy Lecluse, the Frenchman who guided Glenn Plake's team, was among the missing climbers. Remy Lecluse's wife searched for him on the glacier as a mournful burial for him and several other French climbers was held in Chamonix, France. However, his body was located a short time later in a crevasse after being transported there by the avalanche. In the end, 11 persons were killed in the catastrophe. Luckily, several small independent teams had abandoned their climbs just days before owing to avalanche fears. Although some climbers were saved due to quick thinking, others persisted and put themselves in danger. People died as a result of herd mentality during the accident. Despite the warning indications, the larger commercially led teams continued to push up the mountain and the other large commercial organizations felt compelled to get their clients to the top, foolishly thinking. On October 14, 2014, a similar incident foolishly continuing. On October 14, 2012, a similar incident occurred when 43 individuals died on the Annapurna circuit. Many experienced climbers and leaders made unwise decisions as false confidence swept across the groups. These bad decisions became dangerous as guides failed to clip in while crossing crevasse fields, causing their clients to do the same. This herd mentality had infiltrated the minds of even the most seasoned climbers. While tragic, the 2012 avalanche acted as a much needed wake up call for many of the large commercial adventure firms. The corporations were ignoring possible safety risks, putting individuals in danger. Fortunately, as a result of that sad tragedy, the firms and climbers learned their lessons. While we will never forget the tragedy that occurred, an avalanche of this magnitude will have made the mountain much safer for future attempts. While many climbers have returned home, others remain, hoping for another chance to scale the mountain. Manaslu has a lot of snow this time of year, and prior to the avalanche, climbers waited for days in base camp while it snowed. This is quite common. We had the same experience last year. When the weather improves, it is necessary to wait a few more days for the snow to solidify before returning to the mountain to reduce the chance of getting an avalanche by newly fallen snow. This may have overloaded the ice in the Serac fields, increasing the likelihood of them breaking off. Avalanches are really a beneficial thing during those few days of waiting for the snow to solidify because they rid the slopes of newly fallen snow 
which is the snow most at risk of avalanche. Some of you may be startled that expeditions are still taking place in the aftermath of this catastrophe, which is insulting to those who have died. While expeditions are often canceled after an event like this, it is exceptional and there are frequently other reasons. When their comrade Nick Etzcourt was killed in an avalanche, Chris Bonington and his team of elite British climbers famously abandoned an expedition to K2. They were a close-knit group and some of them were discouraged after that, but their decision was not unanimous. A catastrophic avalanche on Gasher Brun 2 in Pakistan in 2007 forced all crews to quit the mountain. The avalanche had been so large that it had changed a long snow slog into a significant rock climb and teams were unprepared for such a task. Death sells. But if their audience isn't interested in hearing about it at other times, there's no need for this desperate dash to cover the story before it's too late. It takes time to identify the deceased and notify their loved ones. In the grand scheme of things, there aren't many people at Manasla right now, and the unwarranted publicizing of dead climbers' nationalities will have worried many people. Because there were so few people in any one country, someone is likely to learn of their loved one's death through the media. Footage of body bags being taken out of the helicopters would have been upsetting as well. After two days of silence, Russell Bryce of the Hymex Expedition Team sent a message that rendered all of the highly speculative media tales outdated. Russell has been in charge of the rescue operation. He kept a list of the climbers on the mountain, organized helicopter evacuations, used his base camp as a makeshift hospital, dispatched Sherpas up the mountain to help climbers in need, and assisted in identifying the dead and notifying next of kin. Only then did he settle down and begin writing about what had occurred. He is a reliable source. While most prominent media sites have clear social media policies stating the abusive comments will be removed, we have witnessed several incidents of the dead being insulted on websites by insensitive and stupid people whose remarks go unmoderated. A woman was killed by a falling limb while walking through Kew Gardens in southwest London about 12 hours after the avalanche on Manaslu. Kew can do little to prevent such a tragedy from happening again, other than cut down all of their trees and prohibit people from walking underneath them. Every second limb falls from a tree somewhere in the globe. No one gets killed. The Q event was a tragic accident for which no one is to blame. A counterpart is the avalanche on Manaslu, which is a strange occurrence. It wasn't due to irresponsibility or congestion, and while bits of ice fall off mountains every second in the Himalayas, there's rarely anyone underneath. The only way to prevent it from happening again is to prohibit people from climbing mountains and to remove all snow. And with that being said, it's time to end our video. Subscribe to the channel for more amazing videos like this. We'll see you with another interesting video.